Yeah, here we are. The BBC catch this, a little tip. They have a great podcast this week, Mindfulness for the Masses, interview with John Cabot Zinn. That's the guy who established the clinic at Western Mass. That is the guy. It's a, it's a great interview. It's a great interview. It takes all about 10 minutes. And now I've got a solid person to go to on the web for other kind of stuff. He's the Emeritus Professor and Creator of the Stress Reduction Clinic and Center for Mindfulness and Medicine, Healthcare, etc. at the University of Mass. <coughs> the President. Uh, he's written a whole bunch of books, maybe three of them. Uh, but I want to point this out, as I said before we really started here. Um, this whole subject here is kind of a, a, a wild guess. I mean, there are Thousands of books on this stuff, thousands of websites on things. So who to believe? Well, depending on what I'm going to, I'm certainly going to pay attention to them, for sure. A lot of experience in a good place. Uh, I mentioned this, I mentioned this in the first lecture, and I'm going to mention it again, because here are, here's one very good site. You do have to pay for it, each one of these things, meditation for your health, and positive mindfulness is really in positive psychology. But each one of them, I think, costs $18 US. You know what? I think that's cheap for getting a really good source. Particularly if you're going to commit yourself uh, for, for something and take it seriously. So, um, so I happen to think uh, this is the best one. This is the second best, and the third in my view. And I'm passing the book around. I don't know if there's any three. Got, you can pass it around and have a look to see what the stuff is. Um, um, so, I thought that was important. And just to show you that it's not just them, Oxford University is into this, Cambridge University in the UK is into this. We're talking about really good places that do their science well. University of California, Los Angeles, Yale, even Toronto. Transcendental Meditation Center. And the NIH, NIH has invested billions in this kind of stuff. They're very good. Doesn't mean that they have answers, that the answers are necessarily going to be any better, but they are critical. They do organize that stuff. That's what their job is. And uh, so the NIH, unlike Harvard, is free. So it's a good site to go to. So I just meant, now, I brought this up before because, uh, and I'm going to repeat it now with some of this stuff, a lot of human behavior is set, or it becomes set, it becomes set early in life. You know, what, what does the book have to say, get them early, got them for life? Well, it's not just a joke, it's true. And, uh, and the brain, uh, I've shown this to you before, but look at the scale, there's a, uh, uh, the start of pregnancy, birth, and this is a log scale. And so really, I like the log here, can I? So six years, 12, so age 10 here, and 100, all right? There's a big story in this because the neocortex, that ribbon of cortex over the, you know, all that ripple stuff, it's 80% of normal size, thickness at birth. At birth. And it attains its kind of maximum complexity within a few years of birth. Not 10, around 4, 5, 6. Doesn't mean it's thinking that it's acquired as much stuff yet. But as a brand new iPad being handed to you with software on an operating system, yes, it has accumulated all of the programs for sure. Hasn't downloaded a lot of stuff, hasn't had a lot of experience. But as a machine, as a biological machine, it's got all the stuff uh, very early. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and then look down here, not to get too depressed, uh, this is the curve of uh, increasing ventricular size. Well, that's an indication of shrinking. Brain shrinks, the 
particular size in some sense, in close relationship. Look at that, it's very thin, it's pointy. And uh, this is based on thousands of MRI studies, right through the age spectrum. So, and these are normal. So there's a message here. Doesn't mean that a five year old is going to outwit you. But they're probably learning faster on an iPad than you are. Or, have you ever seen, I noticed that on my kids, you know, when they have an iPhone or something, they, they don't take instructions, they play with it. They figure it out, they find it out from a buddy or something like that. They just try, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. That's how they learn motor skills. They ape one another. They watch somebody with it on a, a ski run and then try it themselves. That's how that's what we dare do a lot of time, beyond a certain age. And they have that extraordinary on me. You know, two weeks ago, my um, Two grandsons, 14 and, and 12, or almost 13, uh, were out in Whistler doing mountain biking along with my son, Tim, and daughter, Margaret. And, uh, you know, those kids are, they're in here. They're in here. And I've noticed their memories are, they don't forget stuff. And they don't. They dare to try stuff. They're not timid about trying stuff. And they're really quick to learn. And they had excellent, uh, they took lessons. I mean, both of the young guys uh, were all really quite good. And they had an excellent female instructor full time, both skiing and stuff, and with it. She had, had been a financial advisor, took this path. <laughs> Do this, but anyway, excellent instructor, and they learn quickly, really quickly. So their nervous system learns really well early. But it also is a tandem off, and habits are early, and they sink in. And the bad ones actually outlast the good ones. You know, they're they're the ones that that plague people for the rest of their life. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So that's why I'm showing this. I want to drive that one home. And, and of course, and this shows that the, the great pruning or winnowing, synaptic context, meaning context between nerve cells, is really very, very vigorous in the first year of life. I mean, th those are the number of synapses, uh, total number. There, there's the big bump up here. And the great winnowing, because there's a great competition in the nervous system. Or who makes the better connection? And if certain connections aren't weak, the signals aren't, they're, they're winnowed out, they're gone. And the nerve cells disappear without a trace. Uh, and so this shows at birth, you have a lot of nerve cells and very few connections. At two years, well, it's crowded. Six years, cleaned out to some extent. That process goes on through life. And, uh, and uh, so it's a background to what the mindfulness is about trying to change maybe some bad behavioral habits or thoughts. That's really what it's about. Uh, or making you happier, but that's on, on the way to. And uh, so here also, I mentioned this the last time, there are critical periods. The brain, uh, humans learn languages best early. And, uh, and in fact, if they don't learn it before uh, 12 years of age, they will never learn it, no matter how much effort they put into it. And uh, so there are critical windows and uh, for a lot of aspects. Um, so I put this together in a kind of busy summary thing, but, but just follow it. The earliest development of the brain is gene driven. Because that dictates which cells become what cells and, uh, and where they migrate to. That's all under genetic control. And so when the baby's born, uh, the eyes move and they're sucking reflexes. So a lot of behaviors are innate, right? They don't have to learn. 
They're already there. Or um, parental identification imprint, DAWs rings imprint. But humans do that too with, with, with a parent or a significant human who looks after them early. Uh, so that's the early stage, which kind of uh, continues through, the, say, the first several years. Then overlapping that, the second phase, the nervous system adapts to the individual's environment. Examples of which, well, the acquisition of language, I mentioned that, and that critical period. So this is where my kids are in right now. In fact, they're rather mature in this kind of thing. And then that third phase, the continual modeling and remodeling that's going on through the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. But this becomes less robust as time goes by. And then when it reaches us, our age, uh, well, that's another ballgame. And uh, now, plasticity. You've heard about plasticity. Learning to play a musical instrument, weaving, knitting, skiing, writing, all of that. Some kind of new activity. Or learning to change negative emotions and replace them with positive emotions. Both of them are associated with strengthening of some neural connections, creating some new ones, winnowing some old ones, getting rid of them, and perhaps there's this great debate about this, about whether the brain is actually capable of making new nerve cells in the adult here. There is some evidence to suggest that the hippocampus, which is responsible for laying down memories, can make new serve new nerve cells. Well, they may make new nerve cells, but they may make new connections in the nervous in the nervous system. It's all about who you're talking to. It's not about if the nerve cell is actually there, it has to be talking to somebody, somebody else. So we don't know if those new nerve cells, those putative nerve cells, are actually making meaningful connections. Epigenetics is very important. Trombling, uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, was a psychologist at Yale, and he was very interested in uh, what happens with women who are kind of on the street uh, without uh, much in the way of resources. Uh, life is rude and, and difficult. And, uh, and, uh, and they don't have the time or the will to, or even the energy to look after their kids properly. And, and often that the, the kids don't turn out as well as they might. And that happens in disaster areas of the world, right? Um, uh, where kids are deprived of emotional richness and a capacity to learn. Um, now, probably didn't know anything about genetics, but he gave a presentation at Harvard, and in the audience was a group of geneticists who came up to him after and said, hey, We can see it's possible. You, know, you have, when you were born, all of your cells for the rest of your life, the genome is the same. But you have you know, thousands of different cell types. So clearly, as cells differentiate, whole systems of genes are turned off, and others are turned on to create a very special nerve cell. <laughs> Use a liver cell or kidney cell or whatever. Follow what I'm saying? That selection, that activation, deactivation phenomenon is part of epigenetics, meaning the genome remains the same, but the response is not the same. And I think this probably sometimes uh, is in play in, in an, um, inner cities where people are there for several generations and, and, and they just don't kind of have to ever get out of poverty and the situation where actually the brain begins to change. You, you, you almost make the changes permanent. These epigenetic changes can be uh, passed on from generation to generation. Okay, that's very important. And, and it 
and it has an aspect with mindfulness, doesn't it? So the troublesome behaviors or responses to stress in life that have been learned early in life or imprinted because of circumstance or whatever, or opportunity, you name it, um, can become very difficult to change later. No fault of the person. It has a lot to do with their opportunities. So that's one thing I wanted to get off my chest. Oh, I've already done that. Now the brain, well, we know this is a biological learning machine for, for sure. Um, but just go to the bottom. Remembers and retrieves appropriate information rapidly, and in the case of gymnastics, physical skills, martial arts, mountain biking, high speed dancing, it's learned fastest and most efficiently with the teens and early 20s, for sure. There aren't any gold medals going to people in any of those event related events in their 30s, or even in their mid to late 20s. So those stuff, that stuff is learned early, and the nervous system is geared for that. Aging, I hate to bring this up, slower processing speeds, storage and retrieval of memories, less efficient, we know that. Loss of neurons and neural connections and accumulation of faulty memory files, corrupted files if you're a computer addict, and the accumulation of embedded responses and behaviors. So now I'm Positive psychology, I'm not going to say anything about it unless you feel I'm 52, but uh, I actually got a copy of this book and read it, we read it, my father read it, my father-in-law read it, they thought it was great, my mother just practiced it without reading it, and uh, The Power of Positive Thinking. But, uh, but it's not a bad book, it, 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 it does it, it reads well. And, but this is what's happened in the, in the last uh, kind of 70 years. We've got all kinds of descriptors for these various ways to be mindful, happier, live more positive lives, and uh, I'm not going to get into all of that. Actually, the term positive psychology was coined in 1954 by a guy at Western Mass. That was the guy who coined it. Uh, learned helplessness and optimism. It, this is part of this embedding stuff. If you learn stuff early in life, and I kind of understand, especially younger than that, it is really hard for those kids to undo that or change that later. And uh, so I think about Ukraine and kind of the disruption, social disruption, that kind of thing, it, the, the penalty for that kind of stuff goes on. It's the trombley effect. It goes on long after the conflict. And uh, so, oh, but one thing. Can people predict what makes them happy? Well, one study says apparently not. No, we're not very good at it. Um, and, uh, well, happiness, there it is in the American Constitution. We hold these truths to be da da da, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Strange thing to have to have a constitution like that. What other constitution in the world put happiness in there? And we're going to get back to that. Well, what's genetically transmitted? Well, height, 90% of what dictates height is, uh, is heritable, um, but also nutrition. And we know this is a number of kids. You must know this if you have you know, uh, children and grandchildren or great grandchildren. They keep getting taller. Average, and uh, but happiness seems to be circumstance uh, driven, maybe ten or twenty percent. But the important thing is that maybe thirty or forty percent of it is out of our control. I put in this recalibration of happiness with purchases. Well, just how happy does it make you to go out and buy a car, or uh, or redecorate your place, or put in a hundred thousand dollar kitchen? or do this or that to your place. Uh, my experience is very temporary. It doesn't last long. And, uh, and uh, so just because they did a study of lottery winners a year later, five years later, 
as they were miserable before they were miserable of the year. And five years later, within a bigger hole. And uh, so those in-grain traits, which I keep touching on, it's not that important. Getting to happiness. Well, uh, first of all, I don't like the whole idea of getting to happiness, but serve, how would you get there? If you, this was the formula. Serve some other cause outside yourself. Well, that's, that's lottery. Um, the certainty, the second part, focusing your mind on the present. Mind wandering and ruminating about the past and future about matters we can't change isn't helpful. Well, our mothers tell us that. I don't think my father did that. But, uh, but, uh, but yes, I think uh, there's some wisdom in that. Uh, but getting back to the cars, happiness tracks closely with income, but only up to a certain level. Up to kind of meeting basic needs. Beyond that, it's not a losing game. But uh, you have to get a, earn a lot more money. You get a lot more gold bars, as is happening in the United States now, and that kind of thing, to get a little bit of happiness. Okay? Uh, children can be happiness pluses or minuses. Well, they are because they take a lot of time, and, and especially if you're the mom and there's no one else around and you don't have any help and uh, that kind of thing. So it's not. Always the way to do it. The science of mindfulness. Well, um, it's a uh, it's a challenge, and that will come through if you go to the uh, NIH website and the Harvard stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the claims. Uh, for example, evidence suggests mindful practices foster wellness and more positive emotions. I think that's probably true. Um, but um, but uh, the neuroscience behind that lags for sure. Uh, partly because it's very hard to carry out studies um, satisfactorily. So we're going to say some more about that now. But here's some questions. Huh? I'm not going to ask for answers. But I, I put these questions out for myself. I was thinking of what this little talk was. Am I mindful of myself? Do I take stock of myself regularly? No. Am I mindful of myself somewhat? Am I mindful of others? I hope, but uh, not as much as I should. Their nature, their needs, and what they do for you, what they do for others. I think all of us are, would be uh, kind of a six or seven out of ten. This kind of stuff. We're not saints. Uh, if you find yourself coming up, if I find myself coming up short with kindness and gratitude towards others, well, what would I do to change it? And it's not enough to say I'm going to change it. You have to be specific. Actually, do something that's meaningful for the person that you're trying to help, not you. It's not a self serving thing. How might I become more mindful of myself than others? Well, that's the exercise, isn't it, of all of this stuff. It's one of the exercises that we're going through. But I'm just trying to put it in some kind of context. And what was a good life, or perhaps not, for your parents? Well, in my generation, uh, they lived through the Depression. They lived through World War II. Uh, they were tough years. Uh, what I remember of that generation is that uh, a few of them complained, and they just went about doing their stuff. Uh, and, uh, and they didn't have much money. And, uh, and they grew fig tree gardens, and uh, that's how they got through the stuff. I, I certainly remember that. Um, but then, post-war, um, the job market went up, a lot more money, disposable income, and houses started getting bigger, cars got bigger. It wasn't enough to have one car, but it was two cars, now it's almost three cars, and uh, that kind of thing. Religious affiliations, uh, were they positive or negative? Well, certainly when I was in Boston, uh, that was the period when, uh, when the great scandal broke out, and 
that was a full show for me. And I had several priests in my practice. And before that, they used to come in at their dog collar, black outfit, regularly. And as soon as that scandal came out, they were coming in in their flannels. And I got in no dog collar at all because of all the negative flack that they were getting. And frankly, I think a lot of them were, were innocent, but they were aware. And uh, it was hard to do much when the top down was moving people around. So uh, taking stock. Well, these are questions I ask about myself because of this mindfulness series. Uh, you know, um, Stephen Weinberg said, uh, he died a couple of years ago, he wrote a book all over particle physics, but he said, if you want to learn something, teach it. Give a course on it. That's how I learned about stuff. Well, you do it. So, uh, so that's been my attitude about things. So, where is my treasure? Is, the, is my accomplishment, accomplishments really important to you? What do I actually possess? Family and friends, health. Uh, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? I definitely have both. What I wish I had. These are just questions that all of us should think about, I think, from time to time. After all, uh, uh, every year you have to file your income tax. So there's some accounting for your financial life. Why wouldn't you think about the same kind of thing for your emotional uh, side of your life? Why, why wouldn't you do an accounting that way? This makes sense to me, except that I'm making sense in my 84th year. Uh, so thought about this before, but I can tell you I'm thinking about it now. Well, um, meditation. Well, uh, one of the things, ever since the early 1990s, I've had a connection with the Society for St. John the Evangelist, uh, the Episcopalian uh, Oxford Order, but now in Boston, and that's just right on the Charles River, a hundred yards from and they're very interesting. It's the first thing I do at 5 o'clock in the morning. That's when one of the brothers puts it on. Uh, six days a week, there's a homily. And often the homilies, even if you took Gene and JC on it, the advice is very good. These, these guys are used to giving very a lot of counseling to university students and staff and people in the community. They're, they're really good at that. And um, and they have a rule of life, and that requires one hour of meditation a day. Most monasteries, monastic orders, and the equivalent for women or something, they have a dedicated time. Why first thing in the morning? Because it's before the business and emergencies of the day occur. I mean, that's the perfect time. It is absolutely, and I protect that time for myself. I've done that for the last two years. And uh, that's protected time. Uh, on awkward. I'm not saying I'm meditating for two hours, but it, it is a time when I don't pick up my iPhone except for the brothers. That's it. And, uh, and I don't do other busy stuff during that period. Set a time. Well, uh, whatever you do, and, and this has been important for me, whatever I do at that time, be kind to myself and others, and be honest, and fess up to whatever is troubling me or others, um, to whatever or whoever might be listening to me. I, I, I kind of like that part at, at the end. So it's not really dependent on whether GOV is there, although the GOV could be there. Um, and I like Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, um, live simply that others may simply live. Well, we have a climate problem, and it's generated by a lot of us. Uh, we're the ones responsible for you know, burning all the fossil fuels and that kind of thing and consuming them. And it has an impact, not just on us, but the people who can't do anything about it. I mean, there's a great conference in Washington, what, uh, last week or this week? Uh, for all the people in the, you know, those uh, Southeast Asian islands, 
that are very close to the sea level and get swamped as the ocean levels go up. There's an airport here that, that, that would have to, uh, at the cost of many hundreds of millions of dollars, fix it every few years just to keep elevating. So it has a real impact on some people. And what we do matters. And I like that type of, be the change that you wish to see in the world. So if I don't begin to do some stuff, well, who do I think is going to do that? Um, so I think that's important. Barriers to it, well, right off the bat, social media. Social media, let's call it what it is, it's an addiction. It's like alcohol, it's like a drug, it is. And I know that, I mean, I got trapped with YouTube sometimes, watching tennis kind of stuff. I mean, I like watching tennis. And, uh, and then watching uh, some speakers on uh, physics. But boy, is that al those algorithms are powerful. They suck you in at no time at all. And I found myself after a few weeks thinking, God, what happened to my time? And, uh, and it's very destructive. And, and we see this, just go into the street, go into the stores, and there's somebody always in there doing this. Or they got their phone on, they're talking to somebody. Their ear, ear peak. It's that important? Really? Uh, I don't think so. My mother lived without that. My father lived with it perfectly well. We really don't need to communicate with people 300 times a day. Um, so that's, that's really bizarre. And multitasking. Some people seem to take pride in the fact that they can juggle a whole bunch of balls at the same time. Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, there aren't many people that can do that successfully, and I'm not one. So, um, and especially as I get older. Here's something. Long-held grudges and resentments. Getting back to that thing I mentioned earlier, Back to the theme I'm hammering on. Lack of forgiveness. That causes a lot of trouble. Lack of discipline and time. So, well, we don't need to do this. How to get started? Well, um, I'm going to come back to that. Here's something I want to say. It really, this whole mindfulness, there's a certain um, transactional world. This weird enough. It's a, if I do this, I will get this. If I'm nice to people, I will feel better. If I show gratitude, I will feel better. That's the reason that uh, gratitude. Really? My mother would be aghast <laughs> at that. And where do we get that selfishness in our way? I know it's true. I know we do feel better when we that way, but, it's, but make that the prime reason, uh, the selling point for doing it, uh, strikes me as odd. Um, so now I'm going to talk about switch here a little bit. Uh, by the way, I don't know why I put this in. Meister Eckhart was one of my favorite theologians when I was in my 20s. And um, Make these two comments. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. I like that. Be willing to be a beginner in every single one. I buy that totally. I, I get it. Now, I'm not going to do Oliver Sacks. Um, um, if you haven't read this book, read it. It's a gem. It's, just, it's a little gem. And, uh, and um, Oliver Sacks was uh, born in England, West London, to an, uh, into an orthodox, a deeply orthodox uh, Jewish um, community where everyone could walk to the place for food, for any community activities. It was a walking the Sabbath was very important. The tradition, the tradition was very important. Um, Oliver, um, he was of the age when, uh, I remember in 1940, 
it was very nice. So I think it was 40. Uh, when he was in age, I think six or something like that, where the kids were sent out in the countryside to be looked at by farmers and that kind of thing. Because of want. Because of the blitz. Exactly. So he spent several years in this kind of remote, somewhat cool existence. And he was a sensitive kid. Well, anyway, managed like thousands of other British kids came back from this and survived. I think they came back in 43 or 44 to their homes. And um, his father one day, he was now a teenager, 16, 17, something, Oxford was looming, medical school, and the father said, well, I, I haven't seen too many uh, girls around. Um, and Oliver said, uh, well, I, uh, I haven't got any. But, uh, but don't say anything to mother. He did. And the response was, the response was, um, she was all great. She threw him out of the home. I wish you had never been born. That rupture lasted until Sachs was within a year of dying, at 82, 83, 83. He didn't bless, he wasn't in a synagogue ever again. He ruptured all his connections with uh, the Jewish community. He became quite famous for that movie, or at least movie that made a lot of that of Robert Williams' Awakenings, where he was working at a kind of a uh, downbeat hospital, near terminal uh, Parkinson's disease patients who could barely move. And dopamine had just come in. So dopamine gave the awakenings was giving them this magic drug. But there was a negative side because, because of the ripple. But yes, the movement came back, but then they started looking at the tissue. So it's not a thing, it was a, you know, it's a mess. But anyway, uh, he, be, he went through the medical school at, at Oxford, uh, went to, I think, University of California, residency in virology, ended up in New York City, did very well, became quite well known as a writer, an excellent writer, and as a scientist. And, um, but here's the structure. Then, the one day, so he would be um, uh, about nine years before this, they found a melanoma in one eye, and radiated it, that kind of thing, he lost the eye. But, um, but no relapses for nine years, no relapses at all. So he thought it was out of it, so he, he was clear. Um, and um, his cousin Marjorie must have been an extraordinary woman. She was a physician. She was 99, living in Israel, and wanted to celebrate her 100th anniversary. And she phoned uh, all over. And, uh, and she said, well, um, he asked about her health, and she said, well, I don't intend to die now. I will be having my 100th birthday on June 18th. Will you come? Well, he hasn't seen the family. 74 years, 70 years, long, long time. And impulsively, he said yes. He puts the phone down and realizes that, wow, what have I done? He's got a partner in Europe. It's a very orthodox group here in Israel, the family. How will they be received? Well, they will receive really well. Guess is that Marjorie had a lot to do with it. But that rupture it didn't destroy his life, but it came close to it uh, for 70 years until rescued by Marjorie. That's what I was getting at. And then one day I was going down to McMaster one day for, for uh, uh, 
honey. And um, it was an American Thanksgiving day. And there were four guests and the host into an hour show. Well, program was, you know, it was into about five minutes before the first rookie response came and, and somebody had the, some terrific story about some family member who was so disruptive every year and, and uh, made the whole experience of Thanksgiving experience unpleasant. Well, then the other guests all hopped on board with their bad stories. And then the host jumped on board. So what struck me about those is those stories were all rooted in childhood in the home. And they're remembered. And, and they keep coming up. I mean, you have adults in their 50s and 60s talking about what happened to Panda Bear uh, at some time. I mean, it, that's the point. Stuff that happens early sinks in deeply, and it doesn't get fixed easily. And that's what Marjorie did with the phone call. So, reconciliation or not, and um, so um, let's see. There's the book. Uh, this is what he says about gratitude. It's not self-serving. My predominant feeling is what of gratitude. I have loved, I have loved, I have been given much, and I have given much in return. Above all, I have been a sentient being, thinking animal on this beautiful planet. That in itself has been an enormous privilege and adventure. He's wrapping stuff up. He's going to be dead within six months. This is the priority. So we all look at CDs and stuff that we've done, we claim this and that, and we like other people to know about them, and all those important things that we've done. But really, all the sacks and stuff, this is not about happiness. And um, so here's the interesting one. Uh, when my time comes, by all the sex. When my time comes, I hope I die in harness as Francis Crick. Francis Crick and the creator of the DNA, 1953, probably the most seminal, most important paper in in the, in the last century in science, in all of science. So Watson and Crick. So I hope I die at Harvest, as Francis Crick did. When he was told that his colon cancer had returned, at first he said nothing. He simply looked into the distance for a minute and then resumed his previous train of thought. When pressed about his diagnosis a few weeks later, he said, whatever has a beginning must have an end. When he died at 88, he was still fully engaged in his work. In our, well, he's a workaholic. He's, he's, he's surrounded by high stakes science and by people that are doing that stuff. He's, he's into it. And, uh, and he's enough of a biologist to realize, as surely all folks would all realize, that we have an end. There isn't anything in the universe that doesn't have an end. We have the Big Bang, there's probably an end to the universe. Every star is born, every infant period, it dies. Every creature. Biological creatures does exactly the same. So why wouldn't we expect that? And uh, and live as if we expected it properly and, and responsibly. Francis Crick, uh, you know, on this business of consciousness and, and the nature of consciousness, Francis Crick was convinced that the hard problem, which consumed all his work in the latter part of his career, understanding how the brain gives rise, rise to consciousness would be solved by 2030, seven years ago. You will see, he often said to my neuroscientist friend, Ralph and Siegel, and you too, Oliver, if you live to my age, Oliver was good friend. Crick lived to his late 80s, working and thinking about consciousness till the last. And then Oliver says, I love this, I have to say I do not see it as a problem at all. 
And I'm sad to say that I will not see the new nuclear physics that builds that and visages, nor a thousand breakthroughs in the physical and biological sciences. I totally get that. But it's the one little kind of comical thing that I can think about, uh, and I think I put this in the column a couple of times. The one thing, there's a whole lot of stuff I really like to know how things turned out, and I won't. But I, I can, I get it. But I have no idea saying that. And uh, so, uh, no, this is really quite moving. Uh, and it's a masterful piece of writing. A year or so later, in his final weeks, he once more returned to the subject of the Sabbath. Now, he was not a religious person. He may have been born into an Orthodox tradition. But, uh, not a believing person. But the Sabbath had a special hold on him. And he says, and now weak, short breath, my once firm muscles melted away by cancer, I find my thoughts increasingly not on the supernatural, the spiritual, but on what it meant by living a good and worthwhile life. That's the measuring stick I would like for myself. Achieving a sense of peace within oneself, absolutely. Speaking for me more eloquently than I can ever do. I find my thoughts drifting to the Sabbath, the day of rest, the seventh day of the week, and perhaps the seventh day of one's life as well, when one can feel that one's work is done and one may, in good conscience, rest. Beautiful. Express. Very moving. So he's a good, now, I end on this because the Nobel series is coming up, and I haven't said a lot about uh, kind of what science has had to say about mindfulness so far. I think it's kind of dicey at the early days. The NIH recognizes that. Um, even the good people at Harvard recognize that. But, but what's the bar in science? Fairman is the equivalent uh, in Einstein, in my mind, of the bee's knees, the thoughts. And Fetterman laid down the rules for science this way. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. Or, if you're right, Einstein or Fetterman, you imagine it. Then we compute the consequences. What would be the consequences? If that was actually true, what would be the consequences of that? And then you test it. Test those consequences. So, then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what would be applied if this law that we guessed was right. He's choosing his words very carefully. Then we compare it directly with observation to see if it works. If it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. And again, that simple statement is the key to science. It does not make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It does not make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his or her name is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. That's all there is to it. I've never seen it put in such a condensed form, but I can tell you the Nobel Committee functions this way. They wait. Black holes have been talked about, you know, going right back to 1917 as a theoretical possibility. And a lot of people uh, talk about the Theoretical work. Physics is, after all, half of our theoretical uh, theory and half of our experimental work, but the theoretical part. So, a lot of theories. And it wasn't until 2020 that they gave the Nobel Prize. It's not that there wasn't a lot of reasonable evidence, but why? Because no one had seen one until the previous year. In 2019, they actually saw a massive 
massive liability. Billions of times massive or sovereign. A long way away in the fuzzy image of that. And um, so they granted a Nobel Prize. They did another thing. They, you know, if you look at Einstein, he should have won at least three Nobel Prizes. Easily. The, uh, they gave him the prize for, for the photoelectric effect out of the quantum nature of light. Well, pretty bright case. I would give it a shot for that. But you know, when he was 22, he was working in a patent office. He had no university appointment and no PhD. In that year, he came up with the photoelectric effect he came up with that most famous equation, which equates energy with mass. E is equal to mc squared. Absolutely brilliant. He figured out the puzzle of Brownian motion. Why if the little seeds are sitting in the water and uh, the water's cooler and warmer, why did seeds kind of jiggle around? Well, they're being bumped by thousands of little atoms, molecules, and he figured that out. To, to the point of actually proving that atoms existed. That was the first evidence. So he got a Nobel Prize for that. He also showed that time was, that uh, speed was the, that the speed of light was constant, but time was not. That was a revolution, a huge revolution. Should have got a Nobel Prize for that. And his theory of general relativity was absolutely brilliant. And that came in, uh, in, uh, in 1956, I think. They didn't give him the Nobel Prize for that because they didn't want him to because it's controversial. Until 2020 with the black holes and Roger Penrose, who was one of those who was awarded the Nobel Prize, because of his work, showing very clearly that general relativity predicted the shape of a black hole. So here they had a picture of a black hole. It fit with general relativity. Okay, finally they let it that many years later. But he could easily have four Nobel Prizes, easily. And um, so, uh, so we'll just finish up here. Well, mindfulness, the Nobel Prize winners in science, well, you know, I think a lot of the top, the best ones are very mindful. Not a wine, maybe mindful in a very needed thing, but they clearly have focus, and they clearly have commitment. Uh, for, the, for the ones that I know about, that I've learned about uh, in the last few years, they clearly have integrity. They work collaboratively. Doesn't mean they agree with one another, but they they collaborate, and they have a worldwide community. There is nothing else like that in all of our cultures that is worldwide. The language of science is universal. Mathematics is a universal language, and if something is true in general relativity in Austria, it's equally true in Japan matter what the language is. And it's true on Mars, and it's true anywhere in the universe. Nothing else like that is universal in all that humans do. So it has a common language and culture. Competitive for sure. Nothing wrong with competitiveness. Um, and art and science, I will say, this is the link between the two. Physics is one of the most imaginative human disciplines. It really is. And so is art. And they share that. Uh, if you probably knew enough about the brain, you could probably find out similar areas as well. So, um, so on that note, one of you up. Yes, I will. So, uh, so I wanted to pull some threads together. Also, there's a fair bit of meaning in this story, too, because uh, 
I've learned a lot about mindfulness. Yeah. Uh, the benefit of stuff from just reading. Um, I think David Ellison is onto something. And uh, let's go see. Um, that's why I wanted to bring the program to Ben Bill. So thank you very much. Any uh, any thoughts? Yeah. You are so inspiring and interesting. And we're very fortunate to have you doing this in the series. Thank you. All of them. Well, thank you. Yeah.